Suffering breaks our dependence upon the flesh. We've talked a little bit about this too, but especially a couple, couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was last week, we talked in, um, in some depth about the flesh. And um, I, won't, I won't try to beat up the New International Version again, but I am tempted, just so you know. But they translate the word sarx, flesh, they translate that to mean sin nature. And they've missed the point of that translation. They missed the point of that word, of that, the, the vocabulary. The word sarx means the physical body that you live in. And the physical body that you live in, according to Romans chapter 7, is not redeemed. And it wages war against the rule of your mind. It wages war against that internal part of you, the new man on the inside that has been redeemed. And so it's trying to pull you in the direction of rebellion and to walk away from God and to, to live in sin. That's what the flesh is trying to do. Now, of course, one of the reasons we're doing um, Galatians is because in Galatians 5.17, there's a verse there, walk by the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's a supernatural fix to get over the power of the flesh that you live in. But part of the process is God will break you. If you continue to live in, in, in cooperation and subservience to your flesh, God will break this out of you. And he's going to do that with suffering most of the time. There are times he will gently instruct you, but if we're not going to listen, he will break you. For example, Abraham was always busy trying to save his own life, constantly trying to save his life. So much so, he decided he would introduce his wife as his sister. Remember? Why did he do that? Because he didn't want the, the king Abimelech to kill him and take his wife, because I guess she was some looker even at 80. So, okay. You didn't laugh at that. I thought that was really funny. But anyway, I'm trying folks. I'm, you know, I'm here all week. Anyway, so he does that. Um, he's not having a son. And so what does he do? He, uh, he goes along with Sarah and her crazy idea that, you know, I, I, I'm not having a child here. You need to have an heir. And God said, you said, who gave Sarah the idea that she could get ahead of God's pro progress or God's, God's program here and think, I've got a method to fulfill God's promises. Are you kidding me? But this is what she does. So you can go into my, my maidservants and you can have children by them. And we'll just consider those your children and those can be your heir. And there's a war going on right now because of that mistake. Wow. We've had the Arab-Israeli conflict ever since. And so he's constantly trying to save his life, constantly trying to save his life. He did it so well that his son begins to do this too. Lie about his wife. Amazing stuff. And so um, finally, somewhere in there, finally somewhere in this process, we don't know the exact moment. It does, the scripture doesn't tell us that. But at some point, after he finally has, Sarah, Sarah has a baby and they name him Isaac. And so now this is his heir, his true heir. Not some adopted child, but his true heir, who God blessed, by the way, those, those adoptions. But he has this heir. And so he says, I want you to take your son, your only son. What about the other kids? Your only son. And I want you to do what? Sacrifice him. And so Abraham does it. Somewhere in there, Abraham decided he was going to stop trying to save his own skin. And he was going to let God be God and let God bring whatever into his life he had. Now, there's an indication, of course, in chapter 11, that Abraham thought that, that, um, that Isaac would be, would be resurrected and given back to him because he was the son of the promise and he knew that. So he'd connected those theological dots of what would have to happen but he was still going to have to take his own son's life by his own hand. Can you imagine? I can't. Now, God didn't let it go that far, but at that point, then he says, I know now that you believe me because you did not withhold your son, your life. Because if you died without a son, your life, your lifeline had, had stopped, and if you died without a son, you were dead indeed. This was a big deal for the culture. And God broke that. Jacob, 
Jacob has, has swiped Esau's birthright. I mean, I, I think he probably would have ended up with that birthright anyway, but he just had to do it in some underhanded, you know, conniving sort of way because that's what Jacob was like. And so Jacob then, he has to run from Esau because Esau's going to kill him. And so he tries to cut a deal with God, you know, running to Laban's house, his uncle. And he thought, we, we thought Jacob was a conniver. Holy cow. Sorry, I keep, I keep referencing the wrong religion. Anyway, Jacob is running to, to Esau, running from Esau, and he sees this, this, this ladder come down from heaven and angels going up and down. We don't really understand that picture until we see Jesus say, and you will see the son of man with the angels of God ascending and descending upon him. This was a picture of Christ. And, and Jacob tries to cut, he's trying to cut a deal with God. You know, if you bless me, you can be my God. How about that? What do you think? Just, just sign here. This is what he's doing. He's cutting a deal with God. Well, God already knows that he, <laughs> he's already transferred the birthright, the promise from Abraham through Isaac to Jacob. And Jacob already has possession of that. He has no idea what he has yet. He has no concept of this. He may think he did, but he didn't. And so, <laughs> so God already knows. So God, okay. Okay. God doesn't really cut deals. He doesn't cut deals. And at that point, you see him shaping. And Laban takes from him and takes from him and cheats him and messes with him and steals from him and turns him every way but loose until Jacob finally has to just run away. And as he's running away, <clears throat> as he's running away, he has now stacked his, his herds and his herdsmen and his kids and his wives, and he stacked them everything in favor, you know, so it gets more and more valuable till you get to him. He's in the back of this whole, this whole, um, I don't know, flood of people that are coming out of Laban's house. Meanwhile, Esau has gotten word of this. He's raised an army and is going to come in and slice through all those layers and get to his brother and kill him with an army. You think that ought to do it? After herdsmen and women and children, you think? But while he's out there in the dark, Jacob thinks he's got this whole thing. I'm going to, I'm, you know, Esau is not so bad. He's not going to be able to slaughter all those people and get to a place. It's going to, his bloodthirstiness is going to get satisfied at some point and he'll stop and I'll make it. That's what he's doing. He's an idiot, but that's what he's doing. It's a theological term. You look it up. And so he's in the dark there. And you know the rest of the story, right? He's walking along and somebody grabs him out of the dark and throws him to the ground. He spends the rest of his life, the rest of his life wrestling for his life. And he gets the stuffing beat out of him. And somewhere in there, and I'm thinking Jacob was a pretty tough guy. Somewhere in there, he realizes what this is. It's not natural. This is, this is not normal. And when daylight starts to break and uh, the angel of the Lord's kind of done with him. And he says, yeah, well, this was fun. Thanks. And I'm leaving. That's the Dave Lucer translation. And so, so he's going to leave and leave Jacob in a pile and Jacob won't get, let go. And Jacob says, don't leave me unless you bless me. Do you hear the breaking right there? And so what did God do? He crippled him. He touched his hip and put it out and he, he limped the rest of his life. He's a herdsman. Is that an advantage? Why'd he do that? If you look at the rest of Jacob's life, he stopped conniving. He stopped cheating. He'd grouse a little, but he stopped conning everybody and he just leaned into God. It was at that point that God then built the 12 tribes through him. He built that nation through whom the Savior would come. He broke him. We could talk about Paul and his thorn in the flesh. We could talk about David and Bathsheba. We could talk about Moses. I'm the great deliverer and he murders a man. And he spends years and years and years out in the next 40 years. He spends until he's an old man. He's out there in the boonies. He's, he doesn't even get to marry a nice Jewish girl. He marries some, some uh, Gentile lady, has some kids. When he finally is humble, finally humble, 
God calls him back into his service and he delivers the nation. God will break you. If you think that, he would, that he's not afraid to break Moses, but he's not going to bother with you, do, you, do you really think that he's going to overlook you? Suffering breaks our dependence on the flesh. Suffering builds per- perseverance. I've already mentioned snowflakes. 